Hello, everyone. This is Eric Pennington with The Spirit of EQ, and welcome to The Spirit of EQ podcast. Today's episode is on emotional intelligence and success. Life is a journey. Spirit of EQ helps shape and guide the road ahead for individuals, leaders, teams, and organizations striving to realize their full potential through emotional intelligence. Spirit of EQ is a coaching and consulting company that assists individuals and businesses to reach their full potential by developing emotional intelligence. In business, managers and leaders recognize the value of training to develop leadership skills. What they may not realize is that those skills are far more effective when they pay attention to not only performance, but also to people. Emotional intelligence is a crucial skill because people drive performance and emotions drive people. After this podcast, listen for a special opportunity to learn more. Joining me as always is Jeff East. Hi, Jeff. How are you? Hi, Eric. And hello, everyone out there. So I've, I've got a question for you, Eric. Okay, I'm, I think I'm ready. All right. You know, we talk about this EQ stuff. You know, it's, it's supposed to make us be smarter with our feelings, and it's supposed to make us get along with people better. But how can that affect how successful we are? You've heard me probably to nausea <laughs> talk about decision-making and what emotional intelligence does to a person's decision-making skill or level. And I'm saying this from my own personal experiences. You know, emotional intelligence is one of the key reasons that I've grown, especially in the last five years, uh, maybe close to 10 years, in being better able to define things, to be, to kind of live out those competencies that we've talked about on numerous episodes. Okay. Are you talking about this just individually? Uh, It it starts there, uh, and then it certainly can be a a corporate thing. Um, And and I would say, Jeff, it's it's really important because success, you know, it's a word that most people are immediately attracted to because everybody wants to be. But I think some definitions um, or clarifications are important here. Success is not just you making tons of money. It could be that. It, It very well could be that. It's not just that your kids are going to a prestigious college. Again, it could be that. But it also might mean for you success is seeing that third world country get clean running water and your organization that you volunteer for raise the money to get it done and you're going to travel over there to help make that happen. So each person needs to define what success is. So success could change with, I guess, for one of a better term, the season of your life? Oh, certainly. Uh, certainly. Because we've talked about it before. You know, there's certain times where you got into something and you were very, very involved in it. And, you know, it had its maybe inevitable end. And then you went on to another thing that maybe didn't relate to that at all. Or maybe you just changed your view of things. I mean, the things that I thought defined success 20 years ago, matter zero to me now. And and that's not to say that that time was bad and I regret it or anything like that. It just means now it's not as important to me. Uh, a great example, I had mentors and friends, coaches who told me, you know, oftentimes a person comes to a, I think they defined it more so as a Rubicon. And if you maybe remember the story of Julius Caesar, the Rubicon was a river in uh, Italy And at that time, it was considered once you cross the Rubicon, there's no turning back. All roads lead to Rome. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that one has always stuck with me because what they were telling me was that there's a time in your life where you're going to be confronted with a Rubicon and you're going to have to make a decision. And once you cross, the things that you were before will be no more. You'll, you'll find yourself not interested in what was behind you, and you're focused on what's ahead of you. I'm going to ask a question about that. Then. Sure. Can we regret what we thought was a success in the past? I don't know if I'm asking that. No, I, I get it. I, I, and certainly give you the opportunity to clarify if I'm wrong here, Jeff, but I, I certainly could see that. I mean, I've had times in my life where I thought that becoming – wealthy, 
big title, big office, nice car, nice neighborhood was the pinnacle. I got to that pinnacle, and this is probably 15 years ago, and I call it my Solomon moment. It was like, this is meaningless. I'm bored, I'm restless, and I, and I actually, I hate it. And I, I remember struggling with that. How could this be? Wait a minute. I'm supposedly, I got everything that I'm supposed <laughs> to want. I'm successful, but I'm bored. How does that work? So yeah, absolutely. I think though that regret is one that was um, sort of remedied by me turning around, um, and, and you and I have talked about this before in, in the sense of the work we do at Spirit of EQ, mm -hmm. is that we don't want anyone to get into a place of where they live out their life like that. Because you don't want to look back over the years and go, I never wanted to do it. I hated it. Um, I only did it for money or I only did it for prestige or whatever the case may be. So, yeah, I certainly think there can be regret, hopefully a healthy regret. Maybe is a better way of saying it. You know, what, what I've learned to do is to value those things because they're part of your journey, because you can't change your journey. Yeah, and that's, that's a great way of looking at it too, Jeff. Um, and I think I know from my own personal experience um, where I'm, and I still I look at it today, to me, history is designed to learn from and, and to, to help prepare you for a better future, right? Though I might say, man, if I had to go back and do it all over again, I wouldn't do that. But to your point, if I didn't get to the place that I am now to have the sort of the understanding or the enlightenment of where I'm at, I wouldn't be here. Exactly. And so there's a tremendous value, even in those things that maybe, again, if you had to do it all over again, you wouldn't. Because I do realize that there could be people out there who really, really are beating themselves up over things that they thought were going to make them happy and they ended up not. This is kind of my plug for self-empathy. <laughs> yes. If you hadn't already kind of got that sense. <laughs> yes. so. what, what other ways do you think that EQ does affect your or impact the success? Well, with, without getting into um, all of our processes, right? And, and certainly if, if you're interested in this uh, with us, you know, reach out to us directly and we can kind of maybe unwrap it a little further, you know, in the flesh. But there's a thing inside of one of our assessments, the SAY, as I know you're very well familiar with, uh, called success factors. And success factors uh, are made up of four different areas, right? Uh, it's effectiveness, it's relationships, well-being, and quality of life. I've always looked at that as that's those are four places where EQ really shows up. It's where we can actually go, this is where it matters. It's great if we're able to measure, you know, again, your your ability to recognize patterns, which is a competency, right, within our model. But I kind of like take it from the perspective of okay, what is what are what are some things? And typically they need to be a few, they can't be ten. What are the things that, man, I really need to be good at? I really need to see if it's making a difference. And when I think about those four, I think it really comes out in a big way. I'll just use one, for example, Jeff. Relationships. You know, how my emotional intelligence, again, connecting that to success. How successful am I in my relationships will be determined by my emotional intelligence. How high or how low. It's, it's, it's not a pick or choose it's going to be one or the other. And, and you're not talking about the number of relationships. Like you, no, you have 7,000 Facebook yeah. friends. No, <laughs> no. Um, uh, I would say, please take out the social media. Uh, uh, <laughs> I guess there would be benchmarks or measurements. Sorry. Uh, it's all right. Um, but I think it relates to, uh, and I liken it to kind of the circle thing. Inside of my inner circle, my wife, my kids, my closest friends, my, some of my extended family, uh, that second ring made up of maybe neighbors, maybe coworkers, uh, people who are close to, I'm close to, but not as close as the first circle. Mm -hmm. And then that outer circle, that third circle is maybe kind of the world at large. Maybe I met that person when I was on a trip to Washington and, you know, we hit it off and we talked for like 10 minutes about life and family. You know, that's that other ring. So in whole, I mean, in, in all likelihood, Jeff, I mean, you know, close relationships in, in those regards, you're not talking hundreds of people. 
quite frankly, I, I'm thinking it's less than 10 probably. So I mean, you're talking depth instead of width. Yes. Great way to put it. Great, great way to put it. Because at the end of the day, my the quality, the success I have in my relationships, it matters most with my wife. Mm-hmm. She's the most important human being on the planet to me. I need that to be successful. Um, so I want emotional intelligence to drive me to that. It's not as important for the gentleman I met in Washington, D.C. on a hot day in May where we just struck up a conversation because I may never see him again. And if I do, it might not only be, it, it may only be at a, at a conference, right? Now, there's a chance maybe he may move into those other circles and get closer to me, but I'm focusing, and, and for the purposes of what we're talking about, is where does it matter most? With the work we do, we want to make people understand EQ, want to be able to use it. So what do you see the problem? Where, where do you see mm-hmm. it getting short-circuited? Well, I, I think it, it, it comes back to, and we discussed this in a previous episode uh, about uh, refining your purpose. You know, it's this idea about what is most important to me. And this idea that until you really kind of define that, uh, it's going to be really, really difficult to, to, to hit those marks, right? I think the problem really does come down to primarily, though, decision making. If you're in a work situation, and you've got a project that you and your team are trying to get through and you've got to get it done by the end of the fourth quarter and you're like halfway through the fourth quarter and you know everybody's been working really hard and you're kind of tired and someone says you know guess what we're not going to have that resource that we thought we were going to have well there's a decision that can be made with that you could say well this is going to fail I, I, I kind of knew it was going to fail. And all of a sudden you go into a spiral versus maybe using some consequential thinking and going, well, does that mean that really that it's going to fail? Because you said it before, Jeff, in these episodes, emotions are not bad. They're, they're really, it's data. They're trying to tell you something mm-hmm. and being able to analyze what is it telling you and being able to kind of look at it and go, you know what, I want to make the best decision possible. And I won't make that decision well, if I'm being driven by frustration, anger, fear, that kind of thing. So you're just not paying attention to the information you have? I think so. I mean, you know, we won't, nobody's perfect. I mean, you know, and I don't want to make anyone get the feeling that if I do not make the right decision, all things will be lost. <laughs> the future of the world and all of its, you know, I no, it, no, it doesn't. However, if you think about it, when do people get into the biggest ditches? Do they happen immediately or do they happen over time? One small decision that led to another small decision that was another small decision. And then all of a sudden you got a big decision. So that, that first small decision could have kept them on the road. Yeah. You know, I mean, we are guilty as human beings, right, of our pride. We're very prideful. You know, what was the whole thing about us as men? Our, the stereotype of men. <laughs> I don't need any help. <laughs> who, hey, needs, who needs instructions? Who needs instructions? <laughs> I can figure this out on my own. <laughs> hey, honey, I think you're lost. I, we're fine. We're fine. Well, why don't we, why don't we like, uh, oh, why don't you open up the Waze app and see if maybe there's some, I've been driving for 20 years. I know where we're going. I've been down this route, right? Is that not? I, I can remember a quote from Daniel Boone. Somebody asked him one time if he was ever lost. And he said, no, I was just confused for a couple of weeks once. <laughs> so good. there you go. There you go. <laughs> if we're able to, in, in the practice of Spirit of EQ and the work we do, to help people become better decision makers, to help them understand that when you're on the phone with that customer and that customer is just livid about 20 things that really don't matter, but they're unhappy, they're not, they're, they're, they're upset. If you're able to make a good decision in that environment, it's going to lead to something really, really positive. And that is the same thing with your son or your daughter, your partner, your, your, you know, your aunt, your uncle, your whoever. But again, it's that defining of what's most important and then looking at those relationships and situations that matter most. Is, is there a cost to uh, 
have success when good decisions weren't made? Oh, that's a great question, Jeff. You, you should be able to look at your successes and there have to, and, and, and there's a there's a certain level of rhyme and reason to it, even if there were surprises along the way. Because what you described, I think, can be a two sided coin. All of us are gonna be lucky sometimes. There's sometimes when I should have lost and I won. There's always going to be those times when I should have been reprimanded, but I was praised. <laughs> I think that kind of goes to the spirit of why we should all be very humble and thankful. Because yes. I think everyone out there can specifically go to a time when you knew it should have hit the fan because of you. Yeah, it was an oh, whatever Moment. word you want, and then yep. you end up going, Phew. <laughs> exactly. I think most people will, would relate to that on the road, right? When you yeah. are driving over the speed limit and the, the lights come on and the highway patrolman or the police officer goes right by you and gets the person two cars ahead of you. <laughs> you were speeding. Uh, it's just you got lucky. Um, so I know that those kind of situations are there. I, I can't stress enough, if you're making bad decisions and, and becoming successful, there's a price for that. And, 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 and the obvious one is, is that potentially one day you might get caught making bad decisions, right? I think another one is, is it builds a false sense of your abilities. Mm -hmm. I've always felt, again, speaking of living in America, that's my reference point, is that we far too often I mean, we overestimate the reasons for our success. And we, if we're not careful, we'll begin to think that what was maybe luck, what maybe was timing, you happened to be in the right place at the right time when the market was, you confuse that with your ability. Now, I get it. There's a number of people out there. I, I was in that club where I used to think, well, look at what I'm presiding over. It must mean I'm great. <laughs> but the reality is that's a really dangerous thing because it creates a, a very big blind spot. How do we go about learning to do this, to, to use your emotions for decision making? You know, in, in our world, you know, we take people through a process of, of, of assessments and then maybe analyzing the data that comes out of those assessments and then the path forward as far as how do you how do you turn this into behavior change how do you make the course corrections how do you leverage your strengths and all of those things those are certain and true paths that you can take and also there are things that you can do like i said about the the what is most important to you you can pull out a sheet of paper and go you know what here are the five most important things to me okay you can take what we just gave today the success factors and ask yourself, how good am I doing in those areas? You know, am I, am I effective? Meaning, am I getting things done that I'm kind of tasked to do? Am I, am I, am I finding that each day things are, are moving in a direction, even with the fact that stuff goes wrong, it always does. And then my well being, how am I doing physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally? How is that going? Those are assessments, if I can use that term in this regard, mm -hmm. that you can do just on a sheet of paper with yourself in that moment. The worst thing, and this is my great warning, the worst thing that you can do is to do nothing. Because then I think you become the prisoner of the tide. And the tide does not wake you up every morning to say, hey, I just wanted to let you know, we're gonna go about 100 feet out today. Just wanted you to be ready. No, it's no warnings. Mm -hmm. you, 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 you wanna prepare but you don't want to be in a position where you're saying, I don't need to do anything because that, that's a sure recipe. Emotional intelligence, as it has grown, meaning it is, is growing inside of you, there's a corollary that comes with the decision-making process. I kind of liken it to the greater my EQ will mean the greater decision-making I make, which leads to my greater success. The key is what areas are those in? That's, that's the big takeaway for okay. me. Okay, We've been talking about an individual mm -hmm. for the most part. Yep. How does emotional intelligence, how can this help a company making decisions? Is there such a thing as an emotionally intelligent company? 
Uh, yeah, I, I, I believe there is. It, it's a bit more complex or can be, but ultimately any business owner, any high level leader running a large organization or a small one, if you ask them, do you want your people to make better decisions? It, it'll take maybe a millisecond for them to say, of course, of course. Okay, well, why is that? Because they realize that that's what leads to better performance and better results. The stuff that gnaws at these folks is the fact that we're not effective. We're not moving in a direction to get the results we want. But an old friend of mine told me once is that every organization is perfectly aligned for the results that they're getting. <laughs> yeah. And I couldn't agree with him more. Uh, it, it is is absolutely on mark. I think it flows the same way, Jeff. A more emotionally intelligent organization will lead to more employees, more team members making better decisions that will lead to greater success. Now, that's easily said in a podcast episode between you and I, right, and, and, and all of the audience that are, that, are, that are listening. The reality is that it requires practice and work. Um, it requires the effort, and it requires, I quite frankly think, the faith, mm. the belief that this thing is not a line item on a spreadsheet, but it works. And I would tell you, if you were to do an evaluation of the most successful companies who are not just putting numbers up because they were kind of done through some accounting gimmickry, mm -hmm. but they are actually growing revenue. They're actually growing a customer base, getting more market share. Most often, you're going to find some correlation there. I'm not saying it's exact. I'm not saying that every company would raise their hand and say, hey, we're an emotionally intelligent company, therefore but you'll find the corollary. You know, we, we were talking in between uh, the break between the last recording and this one about Tom's. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you want to give a little bit of background of who they are sure. and if you think they're an emotionally intelligent company? Yeah. I will stress to you, my knowledge of Tom's is not enough to where I could, Jeff, I could say, yeah, they're emotionally intelligent. But there's some things that they're doing that lead me to believe that somewhere in the decision-making realm for the company, there is emotional intelligence happening or, or the, you know, sort of the leveraging of emotional intelligence. And most of you may know that Tom's model, buy shoes here at the store, means a pair of shoes for someone disadvantaged, someone who doesn't have shoes, maybe in a third world country. And that's like rinse and repeat, right? So if you sold 10 today in Nordstrom, 10 goes to X. To me, that requires a tremendous amount of decision making. Because I've often wondered, and I, and I don't know if the, the owner of the company's name is Tom, but if he is, we'll use that as an example. I don't know if Tom, when he went to the board and said, here's the big why. And here's what we need to do. Was there a CFO that was like, oh, are you kidding me? Probably not those words. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right? Was there two or three board members that said, I don't see how the numbers bear out? Was there somebody who said, well, then we're going to have to cheapen the fabric of our shoes because there's no way. But my gut tells me, and again, without knowing for sure, that he probably made a stand and said, this is who we are. This is why we're doing it. And to me, that, that equates to being very emotionally intelligent. How would that possibly uh, impact that line employee, that person that is selling the shoes or driving the truck that delivers them or whatever? That's a, that's a great question. And I, and I think it relates back to, and we've had previous episodes. So please, ladies and gentlemen, uh, go back and look at our archives because we talk about the noble goal. Mm -hmm. The impact of that noble goal, and let's just say they've defined that this model is their noble goal, it's inspiring. I mean, everybody wants to be a part of something great. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to know that, you know what, I'm involved in something that's changing for the better. So my gut is those people, when they come into work, they're driven by that goal, that noble goal. They're a part of something wonderful. And I've always believed that 
you, if you've ever walked into an organization, whether it was retail or banking or something like that, and, and the employees just seem kind of comatose? <laughs> yes. Are they comatose because they're just sleepy or somebody slipped a little ether in the, <laughs> you know, in the air or something? I think most of the time it's that they're really not involved in anything that big, that nothing really bigger than them, nothing that noble. They're just kind of did it yesterday, doing it again today. I'll do it again tomorrow and I'll collect a check. They, they have no skin in the game. Yeah, exactly. And I think, again, back to that corollary, right? The higher the emotional intelligence, the better the decision making, the better the success. One thing I should throw out is a bit of, a, you know, sort of the caution, right? Individuals and companies oftentimes are overly fixated on the success part. Mm -hmm. They're not overly fixated on decision making, <laughs> even though they'll say, we all will say, I want to be a good decision maker. I want to make good choices and good decisions. And then emotional intelligence, even though in the last, what, 10 years or so, Jeff, I mean, it's gotten a lot more play. Mm -hmm. uh, we're on a mission to, to educate and, and, and kind of move people to understand how it can be applied. But even within that, if you're overly fixated on success, mm -hmm. I will tell you, you can do it. There are tons of companies and individuals out there that are making tons of money, are, have stock prices through the roof, but if you lack those other two things, I think it's going to be hollow. And it probably means you're not going to be around as long as you maybe aspire to be. And, and I think it's important to remember that we, we've been working with in Spirit of EQ with some KPIs, um, mm -hmm. key performance indicators. And I've been working on my personal one. And one of them is I need to remember that to be able to do the fun stuff, I love presenting, I love the coaching, that's that fits into my noble goal that fits into my purpose i still have to do those other things that i don't like so much to be able to fill my noble goal if if tom's is an example if mm -hmm. they gave away everything and went out of business there you go they 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 have to they have to balance this noble goal this this purpose the why of what they're doing with the reality of the world that you're in yeah and jeff i will tell you from experience uh in one of my past business failures, I used to believe that just because it was a great idea and everybody was going to love it, that that's, that's what we needed to focus on. I didn't think that, well, you wait a minute, I got to look at the P&L and kind of <laughs> weigh word. the <laughs> profit and loss and determine whether or not we need to cut expenses and all that stuff because that was, to me, was boring. I don't, I can't be, but you know what, in that failure, after I was after I had the bitter taste of it, I could look in the mirror and go, there's a difference between an idea and a business. They can be married together. Mm -hmm. That's what it's intended to be, but you can't have one without the other. If again, and even if you're in a social enterprise, even if you're a nonprofit, you can't just be fixated on the cool stuff, the idea stuff. And I was, I mean, I, I was absolutely fixated on that. I, and I look back as a positive regret because I've, I've learned it and I'm continuing to learn it. If back then in that business failure, if I was more emotionally intelligent, making better decisions, leading to greater success. Because I would have made decisions that said, you know what, Eric, it is a great idea. But what you need to focus on right now in this moment on this day is expenses. Okay, that's a, I, I, my emotional intelligence tells me that's, that's the right thing to do. And by making that decision, leading to success. I was just thinking of, let's say you want to start an inner city soup kitchen and you get volunteers that are lined up and you, mm -hmm. you get it advertised and you get a good place to do it. Yep. And the people show up and you don't have any food. Or how about this, Jeff? <laughs> you have the food, you have everything done, it's been advertised. There's three of you that are involved. And the day after it opens up, two of them say, we don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's just you. Yeah. You no longer have two partners. And you got to, what do you do? You go out and find another partner. Or you can't just go out and, you know, hey, I'll go to Kroger and grab a partner. <laughs> <Yeah>. Right? <laughs> it doesn't work that way, right? right. So those are things that, that to your point, man, it, it's, it's, a, it's a huge thing. And I, I would tell people, you almost don't have to think about the success. I mean, really. 
Mm -hmm. If you do the first two, you're going to be good because the success will flow from that. Again, and, and some of it is my bias toward don't get so fixated on the success. And I, I've used this analogy before past episodes with you directly is we love it when Steph Curry hits a three-pointer that it seems like, how in the world did he do that? How in the world could somebody take that long range of a shot and hit, like, all net? We're just enamored with that. Look how, look at that. Look, he's the greatest shooter in the history of the NBA. But do you think that Steph Curry just wakes up every morning and just goes, you know what? I'm going to drop 40 tonight. Hey, can I have a beer? <laughs> no. No. He's in the gym, and he's working. He's refining. He's putting all of his effort into that. And that's, though we, we put a lot of limelight on that, it's for the gentleman who's owns a landscape company and is hauling a bunch of mulch. Applies to them, too. Uh, he, he could be thinking, by this time, I should be sitting in the air-conditioned office. <laughs> Why am I out here sweating, holding onto a wheelbarrow? Right, right. But why is he doing it yeah yeah that 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 says a lot we appreciate you guys tuning in and uh, we will uh, chat with you in the next episode take care thanks everyone thanks for subscribing and listening to the spirit of eq podcast with jeff east and eric pennington spirit of eq is a preferred partner of six seconds the emotional intelligence network Six Seconds is a nonprofit organization researching what works in emotional intelligence. Best practices are shared through methods and tools that are global, scientific, and transformational. To find out more about Spirit of EQ or to request a speaker, go to spiritofeq.com. Our contact information is in the podcast show notes as well. And now for our special offer. Hi, this is Jeff again. I just want to let everybody know that if you have any questions or want more information about anything we've talked about, just send me a quick email. My email is jeff at spiritofeq.com, and I'll get right back with you. Thanks.